Okay, well, it's, it's uh, wonderful to be back in Pensacola. I want to thank Senator uh, Broxson for being here. I we'll also want to thank the folks who are here that are going to share their stories about early treatment with monoclonal antibodies. We have Angela Moore, Sean Tramer, Melody Henson, Yvette McClellan, and James Matarena. Did I say that right? Yes, sir, Matarena. Okay, and uh, we're uh, excited to hear from them. So today, Florida will pass uh, over 50,000 treatments with monoclonal antibodies at the 21 sites that we established uh, throughout the state. And um, since that time, we've seen uh, dramatic reduction in hospital admissions statewide, uh, decline in the hospital census, and decline in the number of people uh, going to emergency departments uh, for COVID-like illness. And so we uh, you know, done almost 13 million vaccinations in Florida. Uh, we spent a lot of time, obviously, on that. As we got into the summer, we started to see uh, admissions increasing, and actually admissions increasing very rapidly in almost all corners of our state. And we uh, identified the fact that uh, over 90% of the folks that were being admitted did not get a monoclonal antibody treatment uh, prior to being admitted. This is something that's been available since December. Uh, it received emergency use authorization both for the Regeneron, which we're using, also the Eli Lilly, which is not being used as much because of the lack of efficacy against the Delta variant. Uh, but this has been used uh, in Florida. Most Florida hospitals have been doing it. it. But it was the type of thing where if a physician referred you, then you would get it. Uh, a lot of people didn't know about it, and a lot of physicians even didn't know about it, to be honest with you. And so, uh, even though we had this available, it became apparent to us that too often the message was to people, hey, if you get COVID, just go home and hope you don't get deathly ill. Uh, and our view here is, is, is that's got to be, those days are over. Uh, if you are somebody, particularly in a high-risk category, who contracts COVID, you have an opportunity uh, to get early treatment with uh, monoclonal antibodies, which have proven to be very effective. And so we're, uh, we're glad that we were uh, able to, to, to identify this and really spring into action very quickly. And the numbers um, you know, have been very, very encouraging to see the people that are able to get it. And of course, if you're never hospitalized, then you're gonna recover. So this is all early treatment saves lives. I mean, that's the name of the game. But it's also true, most people that get admitted to the hospital for COVID do recover and are discharged, but who wants to spend time in the hospital? You don't have to. You can get an early treatment and help, help those symptoms resolve short of needing that type of care. Uh, that's much better for you than having to go there. It's also better for our health system uh, to have fewer patients to have to, have to, uh, to tend to, uh, particularly as we saw you know, patient loads swell in many parts of our state. Uh, so it also helps that as well. And then just in terms of living your life, you know, folks are getting COVID that have responsibilities. And if you can get this and get back on your feet quicker and sometimes very quickly, that's a huge, huge thing as well. I mean, we have mothers, fathers, you know, people that are running businesses, people that are key employees, all this different stuff. So this helps and it's a big, big deal. Now, we have 21 sites throughout the state of Florida. Uh, we have two in, in the Panhandle, uh, one in Panama City, and then we have one in Fort Walton Beach. And our, and our idea was we tried to space them out so that people would have relatively easy access. Now, not five minute drive for everybody, but we did it. But we've also seen the Fort Walton site has had pretty good, uh, pretty good patronage of it. Uh, we believe people from Escambia have gone over there, but we also think uh, in addition to what the hospitals are doing here, we could probably do uh, a, even a footprint in Escambia. So we are going to be doing uh, a site here in Escambia. It'll open next week. We've already, um, uh, we've already got it approved. And so folks in Pensacola, folks in, in, in this area, uh, you'll obviously, if you're in Escambia, you'll probably go to the Escambia one, uh, but we'll keep the Fort Walton one and we'll also, we'll also add one here. So it's gonna happen. Stay tuned on the exact date. It's approved. It's just a matter of making sure that, um, that we have everything uh, going. And if you want to find out more information about treatment options and locations, go to floridahealthcovid19.gov. And to register for treatment at a state site, please visit, please visit patientportalfl.com. Just like six months ago, if you wanted to register at a vaccine site, you could go to that and do it. Now you can do the monoclonal antibody treatment. 
It's also important to point out, you do not need to have a formal referral from a physician to go to one of these state-supported sites. We have a standing order by the State Surgeon General, and it, it basically authorizes folks who fit the criteria that, um, that, that the emergency use is approved for. And basically, the treatment is geared towards folks who are at elevated risk for severe COVID-19. So people who are elderly, people who are overweight, uh, people who have diabetes, people who have cardiovascular problems, lung problems, kidney problems, a lot of the same comorbidities uh, though, that we've seen throughout this, uh, this can really, really make a difference uh, uh, for you. I would say if you're 50 years of age or older, the chance of you fitting into the criteria is very high. And so I would say you probably are going to be able to come and get the, uh, to get the treatment. And again, the, the key to this is getting it early. When people get infected, you know, fortunately, most people that get infected, they recover with no problem. Uh, they don't need to go to the hospital. And, and obviously, you know, they get back on their feet. Uh, that's because people create antibodies. Your body creates antibodies, fights back when you get infected with a virus like this. And most of that time, that works very well. Well, there's other folks, particularly in these categories, you know, the body may not be creating the type of antibodies that you need or sufficient numbers. Some people aren't producing any antibodies when they're infected. That really gives the virus the ability to, to kind of run wild and really, really get more severe. So what this treatment is doing is it's creating an antibody response. It's an antibody cocktail goes in and then the antibodies really uh, fight back against the virus. If you do it early, it's very, very successful at resolving symptoms short of hospitalization and obviously you'll, you'll, you'll recover and will reduce mortality. If you wait until you're very, very ill in the ICU at that point uh, on mechanical ventilation, I mean, at that point, it, it's probably past the window where this is really gonna be effective. So the key is, is just early. Uh, if you're somebody particularly in these high risk groups and you, you get infected, do it. Now here's the thing. The vaccinations, I mean, we obviously have 13 million people have been vaccinated. We're uh, over 80, I think 82, 83% of those over 50 have gotten shots. Well over 90% of seniors have gotten at least one shot. Uh, so we have a lot of vaccinations. It is uh, helping people, if you're infected, reducing the likelihood dramatically of you being hospitalized um, and of dying, which is great. At the same time, breakthrough cases, they call them, people who are vaccinated, it's not really a rare thing to get infected at this point. I mean, I think we're seeing that. I think we see more and more people uh, obviously getting infected who, who are fully vaccinated. And the fact is in Florida and most places, most of the very vulnerable people are vaccinated. And so if they have a, an infection after vaccination, they still may need a treatment on top of that. And that's fine. And so it's not really tied to your, to your vaccination status. It's more tied to, to your risk and we've been able to, uh, to help particularly some very elderly people uh, who got vaccinated many months ago and uh, were able to do it. It's also just the fact that as the data comes in, there's a concern about the waning uh, efficacy. Uh, certainly against infection, it's not producing the kind of 95% reduction that the clinical trials have promised. I think that's pretty clear. Uh, and then CDC most recently observed uh, a slight reduction in efficacy against hospitalization for people over the age of 75. So it had been over 90%, now they think it's 80 some percent. So it's still very good and it's still offering protection, but you also gotta have an ability to, to treat as well. And so there's a the prevention, but then also the treatment and we, um, you know, for far too long, the treatment was neglected. So we're not doing that here in Florida. So we're, we're, we're happy that people have been able to, to be aware of this now. We're, we're glad that people are doing it. And we're obviously very glad to hear the positive uh, stories and hear the positive response when people get better, because that's what it's all about. So I'm gonna let Senator Broxson come up and say a few things, and then we'll hear from some of the folks who have, uh, who have had this treatment. Thank you, Governor. Thank you big for being here. You know, they say the government moves slowly, not in your administration. We set a standard when COVID hit Florida of offering vaccines to more locations quickly, and you did that. Many people chose not to do that. And rather than saying to those folks, you're just, you know, that was your personal decision, we have doubled down now with treatment that says if you have not had the vaccine, which we still encourage that you should, we're gonna give you an option where you're not gonna be in the hospital. And because of you, 
in warp speed with the three hospitals sending a message to you this week, we were able to cobble together a program through the county commission and city. And we're gonna have a program here because it works. And uh, I, I listened to the testimony in the back, it's phenomenal. This is uh, something that we used in the Senate under President uh, Simpson. And uh, now the people of Florida know it and you're sending that word. Thank you, Governor, for your leadership. Thank you for what you've done. And thank you for sending a signal to the rest of the state that you can keep the economy open and still keep people safe. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so we're gonna hear from, uh, we're gonna hear from some folks. So Angela Moore, can you come up and uh, tell us about uh, your okay. treatment? Yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. yep. um, I contracted COVID on a Saturday evening two weeks ago, and by Tuesday, I couldn't stand, and I had a fever of 99 to almost 103. I spent two days and finally got the COVID test two days after that. Um, three days later, I was able to get the monoclonal infusion, and I went in there with a fever, and I came out, and I didn't have any more symptoms except for fatigue from that time forward. Great, wow. thanks. Okay, Sean Kramer. Yeah, uh, so my story is very similar to most people you're going to hear. About two weeks ago, I uh, came down with some symptoms. I'd previously been vaccinated back in February, so uh, my symptoms weren't uh, nearly as severe as what I suspected them to be COVID-related. Uh, it was a classic symptom of loss of taste and smell. So I contacted uh, one of my doctors that I knew at the VA. Uh, we talked about the options as far as uh, getting on the cocktail, and uh, I stopped him and I said, what's the the outcome of that, he said, within five to seven days, you'll feel great. And I said, well, what about the monoclonal uh, antibodies? And he said, well, where can you get that? And so as uh, the governor stated, uh, he was unaware of it. I sent him the link, and he said, you'll feel great within a day if you go get that, is my suggestion. And that was my experience. With two days later, uh, I tested negative, uh, got back to work, and that was my goal, not to uh, expose anybody else to uh, my profession, and got me back. So thank you. Great. All right. We have uh, Melody Hinson here. Yes, my husband tested positive for COVID uh, on the 14th of August. The next week, I tested positive. I immediately got in touch with my doctor because I knew from what I'd heard and read he had to have a report. That Monday, we met via Zoom. She said, I will call the hospital make the referral, but you may take a day or so, a little two hours. I had an appointment for the next day. And I went and got the infusion, because I hadn't heard a whole lot about it. But I went in there, and the staff that administered it, a lot of them were there on their own time, because they believed in it. They believed in what they were doing, the benefits. After that afternoon, when I got home, my taste came back and went, oh, I have to taste good. Uh, the achiness, all of that went away. I still don't get out and try to overdo, because I'm no better than that, I know how I am. Um, but the next step is for my husband to be able to eventually get this infusion, because it does help. It helps people that to, to keep them from going into full-blown COVID. And I watched it and it's no, it's no fun. But we've been blessed with all this and I thank you for the effort and the push that you were doing because there's people here that don't have insurance, that don't have those referrals that are gonna be able to get that help that each of us have been able to get. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, Yvette McClellan. Thank you, Governor DeSantis, for bringing the monoclonal antibody infusion treatment to our area. Thank you, Mayor Robinson, for asking me to come and give my uh, testimony on my treatment. On August 22nd, I started feeling sick, felt like a head cold, was just coughing, and I didn't want to infect my coworkers, so I stayed home Monday, and I went and got tested. I tested positive for COVID, and basically was told there's nothing I can do for you, and they escorted me outside the back door. Didn't need me to go back to the lobby. But anyway, my husband came home that day, and he actually started feeling bad, 
And he figured, well, I'm not gonna get tested. You probably, I have it, you have it, so I'm not gonna worry about it. My boss, Amy Lavoie, who's the funniest director of the city, she actually gave me the link from an article where Sacred Heart would give you <coughs> antibody infusion. And so I said, you're gonna go get tested. He went and got tested, he was positive. By Friday, we had the antibody infusion. We did it. He came home, and he was better that afternoon. I mean, he was a lot sicker than I was. And so I'm so happy that we were able to do that. Um, I will say that there's a lot of people that I know that I have, they have lost their loved ones from COVID. My coworkers, actually one of the ladies in my office, her husband was buried this week. So I encourage everyone, and thank you so much for pushing this. I encourage you all to go and get this antibody infusion as soon as you start feeling anything. Because the sooner you get it done, the faster you're going to start feeling better. And that will keep us all out of the hospital. Okay. James? Uh, yes, I uh, tested positive for COVID on Sunday. Um, I actually work for a service where we have a medical director that we work with. I called him immediately and asked him what I should do next. He uh, told me to start driving towards Fort Walton. So that's what I did. And while I was en route, my wife actually scheduled an appointment on the line. And by the time I got there, I had a Q code. They scanned it. And I was in and out within an hour and a half. And I actually tested negative four days later. And I got nothing more than but a stuffy nose. And we're just very thankful to have this treatment. As I've seen COVID patients, severe COVID patients, and taking care of them. It, uh, it, is a, it is a true blessing, and uh, we're very thankful for you, and we're thankful for all you do for us. So. Thank you. And just to uh, make sure make sure everyone's clear, at the, at the, at the state sites, these, these 21 sites, obviously we'll have more when we do with Scambia. We are going to do some more in some other parts of the state as well uh, where, there's a, where there's a demand. Uh, this is not at a charge to the patient. The, the Regeneron that we're using has already been purchased long ago by the federal government. Uh, it was purchased, I think, uh, in the later part of 2020 under the Trump administration. So that's there. And so you use it or you don't, but it is not going to be a charge either way. And so I wouldn't want to, you hear a lot of misinformation out there. Uh, you hear people try to push narratives. Um, you know, that's a lot of that's just political nonsense. You're not going to be charged for it. And so I wouldn't want anyone to be dissuaded from seeking treatment that could help them because they think somehow they're not going to be able to afford it. Uh, no, we're, we're going to be able to do, and we're going to kind of keep, we're going to keep uh, working very, very hard. Also, um, important to point out, the Regeneron that we're using is also approved for use as a prophylaxis. So if you have high-risk people in particular, where you may have someone that uh, contracts COVID, like at a nursing home, you, know, you can go in and, and apply that prophylactically to uh, nursing home residents, for example, if they may have been exposed. So that's, a, that's an approved use. We actually had a, I had a lady write into me saying how uh, she was, um, had been exposed, she was feeling bad, the, the doctor just told her to just go home and wouldn't give her anything. And so she says, you know, since you had the standing order um, for this, I went to one of the sites. I knew I could do it prophylactically. I did it. And then she has other health problems, and she ended up going to see a doctor. We later said, if you hadn't gotten that, you probably would be dead right now. Um, and so it can be very, very effective uh, if you use it as a prophylaxis, and we want to make sure that we're able to do it. It's also the case that we do, you know, can be done as an IV infusion, but the Regeneron also can be done through injections. And so you can do subcutaneous application, uh, usually one, two in the belly and one in each arm. Uh, the good thing about that is you don't have to sit in a chair for an hour. You kind of go, they do it, they will observe you, but they can see, continue to see other patients in that whole process. And so that's a lot of our sites. Most of our sites probably do uh, between 175 and 225 a day, but we can do over 300 at almost all of these sites. And so there's a handful around the state that typically hit about 300, but most of them are usually there, but it gives you an ability to do more if there is more demand. And fortunately, you know, on the one hand, uh, you know, we're obviously seeing admissions go down and some a lot of good signs, but because this is now, every time one of these folks gets it and then talks to their friends and family, mm -hmm. light bulbs go off. And we've obviously worked really hard over the last many weeks to get the word out 
And now we're, we get people writing in from across the country saying, thanks, I saw your press conference in Ormond Beach and I'm in whatever state. And so I got COVID and I went and I asked for it. And they didn't have it in my community. I went and I tried to find it. So we've been able to do a, a lot, but to me, the most powerful uh, examples are the folks that, that have done it. We had a lady in our Jacksonville site that was really in bad shape. She was actually just laying on the floor waiting for a monoclonal treatment. Someone took a picture, which wasn't appropriate, and it went viral. And she got the monoclonal, and then like a day or two later, she was basically fine. And she would have been, you know, probably a day or two would have been in the ICU had she not gotten it. So you see that, you hear the stories, people talk, now more people know. And it's not just the people who are infected with COVID, it also just lets people know who may have some apprehension like, okay, there are, there are things you can do uh, if you end up uh, uh, getting infected. And so I think it just helps people with their peace of mind as well. So we're looking forward to being able to do the Escambia location. And uh, we will have news on that very, very shortly. It will we'll start sometime next week. In the meantime, I would just encourage folks to, if you need it in the meantime, look to your local health system here, which has done a very good job. And then also you can go over to our Fort Walton site uh, and, and do that as well. And that's another important thing. If you are in a community where our sites may not be uh, perfectly convenient for you, just know the health system is doing this. Uh, they may not be doing it in as large a numbers as, as always ne necessary, but, but it is available. And so make sure you're checking that as well. These sites are really supplementing what had been going on. And obviously it's been helping to raise a lot of awareness about what's going on. So we look forward to seeing this here. I think it'll help a lot of folks. And look, as we go forward on this thing, I think people, um, you, know, you, look, you, you look around, you look at a country like Israel that is experiencing big waves, uh, high vaccination rates. You know, in Florida, we have the highest vaccination in the Southeast um, and we're better than the national average, yet we've dealt with a, a Delta wave. So I think everyone's gonna have to deal with this. You know, and we'll see kind of going forward what happens, but I can tell you, if this is something that everyone understands is available, uh, you will absolutely reduce uh, the number of people being admitted to hospitals. You will absolutely uh, take weight off the hospital system. And yes, you will save lives. And so that's what it's all about. Okay, I can take a couple questions before we leave. Yep. Yeah, earlier this week, you talked about um, possibly releasing county level death data. Have you looked in, into that anymore? Have you Department of Health is looking at it, yep. Is that going to come out? Uh, I'll refer you to them. I haven't been able to uh, to address it since, uh, since since we talked about it the other day. Yes, sir. In terms of the, uh, the $5,000 fine for vaccination status coming into businesses, what do you say to the business owners that, that say we want to make our own rules and feel being stepped on a little bit? <laughs> well, respectfully to them, I would say vaccine passports, uh, one, I'm vaccinated. Uh, I'm offended that someone would make me show something just to go to a restaurant or just to live life. And there's a lot of people uh, who've already recovered from COVID who do have immunity. You actually are saying me with a Johnson & Johnson shot can go in, but someone who's recovered from COVID and probably has stronger immunity, they can't go in? I'm sorry, that is anti-science. I also don't want two classes of citizens. You know, we have some people in, in, our, in our communities who just made the decision this is something that they're not going to do. So what, you're going to write them out of society? They're not going to be able to go show their face? And some of these places that have vaccine passports, because the little kitties aren't eligible for vaccine, some of them are saying, yeah, if you're under 12, don't even come in. And it's also the case that as much as I uh, am happy to see vaccinated people get good protection against hospitalization and death, and it has been good, the fact is, it is spreading regardless of vaccination. I mean, that's just the reality. The theory behind a vaccine passport is, okay, if, we, if you force everyone to be able to have it in order to kind of live in society, then you'll be able to basically just uh, new, co new COVID. But we know that that's not the case. You know, very, very high vaccination rates, you still have big waves. So it just doesn't make any sense. And, and my view is uh, we got to protect people's ability uh, to, to, to live their lives. I don't want uh, a biomedical security state in which you're constantly having to do this just to be able to live everyday life. Um, at the end of the day, uh, the, the vaccines have helped people ward off severe illness. Um, and you know, we obviously work very hard to distribute it. 
the end of the day, though, it is what somebody, it's about your health and whether you want that protection or not. It really doesn't impact uh, me or anyone else because we've seen the data on this. And so the theory behind it, I think, has gone totally up in smoke. And I also just think that uh, there's been huge mistakes made along the way with some of these authorities lecturing people um, about this. I can tell you, there's a lot of folks that when they hear that, uh, if they're on the fence, that pushes them in the other direction. Uh, that is not the way uh, that you do it. You know, what I try to do is just give the data. I give it honestly. I'm not gonna sugarcoat it, and I'm not gonna tell somebody uh, something that, that is not true based on the data just because I want them to behave in a certain way. A lot of these folks, they tell these noble lies because they want you to behave in a certain way, and so they don't give the whole truth. I mean, you look at the fact that we're even having to do this with this early treatment, that, that should not, we should, I mean, we're happy to do it because we want to help. But this should have been something that was screamed from the rooftops uh, from HHS and CDC since last December. Can you imagine if 100% of Americans knew that this was something that was available? You know how many people we would have kept out of the hospital? You know how many people that would not have died over the last nine months? Uh, that's just a fact, and um, we're obviously correcting that in Florida, and we're actually helping other states too because we've put a lot of emphasis on it. But you know, I look at that and I wonder why, if you have a, a, an effective treatment, I mean, this this treatment was used on an experimental basis to the president of the United States in October, and very effectively. Uh, why would you not be talking about it? And I think one of the reasons that people didn't, want, some didn't think that they should talk about it, is because they didn't want people to think okay, maybe you don't need to get vaccinated, maybe you just get the treatment. And they worried that people would, would take that message. And my view is, is you know, we, we've never said it's either or, we think that they complement each other, but if someone does do that, that's not a reason to not give them the full information. That's not a reason to provide this you know, for everybody. So you know, I think some of the stuff with, with the vaccine passports, I mean, it's an overreach, to be, it's too intrusive. And at the end of the day, my philosophy is, as governor, my job is to protect your individual freedom. My job is not to protect corporate freedom. That is not what I'm here for. I mean, we have a good business climate, we have everything, but this idea that businesses can just do whatever they want and invade your privacy and doing all that, no, I'm not signing up for that. I'm signing up for protecting your freedom and making sure we have a society in Florida where people can make the best decisions for themselves um, and for their families. And that's what we're doing by protecting against these mandates um, and making sure that that's done based on what people uh, believe is best for them and their families, but not something that's imposed either by government or in some respects, in some instances, by very, very powerful uh, private entities. Okay, guys, we'll, we'll, we'll hope to, to have a good grand opening here next week. So thank you. You ready?